Hey y'all, here OS Reviews. Today we're taking a closer look at the Celero 5G Plus. On paper, this $150 Android smartphone seems like one of the best value new devices that you can pick up, although it is a carrier exclusive to Boost Mobile. It sports a 7-inch Full HD Plus resolution 120Hz display, a actual glass back instead of plastic, which is what we usually find on a lot of Samsung's Galaxy A series products, coupled with a Qualcomm Snapdragon 695G product processor, which is 5G compatible, it's octa-core clocked at 2.2 gigahertz, it supports 6 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigs of built-in storage that's further expandable via a micro SD card slot, and also a 5000 milliamp hour capacity battery that even supports Qi wireless charging. Connectivity options including NFC, GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi are all fully stacked. The phone can be found in colors of gray or this very vibrant orange that's part of the launch edition that is, again, in the Boost Mobile theme. You also have access to a USB Type-C charging and sync cable. There is a bundled wall adapter, something that you don't get, ironically, in more premium devices, although it is using just a USB Type-A port and supports 5 volt 3 amps. You also get access underneath here to a SIM card ejector tool as well as a quick user guide. Taking a closer look at the design of the Celero 5G Plus, one thing that is worth mentioning is Boost Mobile did release the regular version of their Celero phone last year, uh, which can be found for around $100 and was also a very high performing device for a budget price. But you are getting a lot more for your money, including an upgrade from plastic to glass on the rear, so it's actually cold to the touch, supporting again wireless charging so it's a good use of this material, along with having upgraded cameras, a more power-efficient Snapdragon chip instead of MediaTek, larger screen, faster refresh rate, more RAM, so pretty much everything has been upgraded. Regardless, it has still a pretty similar design, which is inspired, I'd say, by the newer iPhones. It has a very shiny appearance that kind of glistens across the light when you are using it in the sun, and it does catch your attention, make it look like something much more expensive than the price here would imply. So we have the 50 megapixel primary lens along with a LED flash, again that wide angle lens, and also a depth sensor. On the bottom you have access to the Type-C port which supports up to 15 watts charging. It is a little on the slow side, and to charge up the massive 5000 milliamp hour capacity battery, you'll be waiting for around 2.5 hours, but luckily the energy efficient chip keeps this phone running for around a day and a half to two days before you really have to recharge it again. There's also a single loudspeaker along with a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, always nice to see in this day and age. The frame of the phone is made out of a polycarbonate plastic, but overall still feels very solid. The side here, which has a power key, also acts as a fingerprint scanner, which is relatively fast and responsive, slightly raised out to make it easier to click compared to the last gen model and also a volume rocker. The left hand spine features just the SIM card slash micro SD card slot and that's pretty much it. So a very simple design. Now of course as a budget phone there is no official IP rating so that is one thing that you won't find compared to more premium devices but all in all I think that they have done a really good job when it comes to the build. So the design may also seem similar to some of T-Mobile's Revel smartphones because they are actually made by the same manufacturer or OEM called Wingtech. Uh, this company basically works with a lot of carriers and specializes on custom made phones for carriers which is why the Revel devices under T-Mobile's line are in purple versus again in Boost Mobile under the Celero line is in orange or gray. Coming to the UI side of things, it's currently running on Android 12, uh, so fairly up to date and very clean. Thanks to the 120 hertz variable refresh rate, we are getting super fluid interactions. It will automatically adopt itself depending on the context to preserve a little bit more on power. Contrast is not going to be quite as popping as on an AMOLED screen, but for this price point, you really can't complain. Aside from the standard Google apps, in fact, there's hardly any bloatware in the form of any games or content pre-installed. In fact, on this particular model, I even had to install the Boost app myself just to get it set up and check out my account status. So it's super clean. 
leaving a generous amount remaining for you to install the actual content that you're interested in, plus you can always supplement it further. Other gestures that you have access to include double tap to wake on the screen, which also works relatively well, typical Android shortcuts including tapping on the power key two times to bring up the camera interface, long holding on the power key to trigger the Google Assistant can also be activated. Let's take a closer look at the camera next. We have a pretty standard UI that's not too advanced, but gets the job done. So for instance, if I am putting something on the side here, at least it is relatively fast to focus. The UI here allows us to capture the standard resolution shots, which come out at 13 megapixels. To activate the 50 megapixel resolution max mode, you can find it under more and then click on 50 megapixels. Under here, you can also find additional controls, including Google Lens for searching things using the camera. You can also find a live focus mode, which is using that second camera to act as a depth sensor for creating the artificial bokeh and the strength which you can also apply. One slight con here though is for video recording it's currently capped at 1080p up to 60fps so there is no 4k capture at the moment which is not a limitation of the chip so that is something perhaps they could enable in the future but overall it is what it is. Last but not least there is a night mode although it doesn't really rival the performance of something like a pixel or the latest iPhone. It does a reasonable job when there is a little bit of light around you to try and brighten up the image and it will take a few extra seconds to capture a shot preserving more details but you also have to hold steady while it's doing it since there is no optical image stabilization. Overall it's not too bad in terms of focusing on close-up images as well using just the primary lens. Images don't take too long to snap. Here's an example of a 50 megapixel resolution shot, which by the way takes up about 24 megabytes of space compared to a regular shot if captured using 12.6 megapixels takes about 7 megabytes. So it will, again, eat up a little bit more of storage space. When it comes to the color profile, there's not a huge dramatic difference, although you are able to crop in and zoom a lot more in the max resolution mode. So for example, I'm able to see lots of details in the tree kind of snap into focus as well as a lot of the branches here in the background. Compared to the same shot under the regular resolution, you're not able to zoom in quite as much as you can see there. And there's definitely not as much details if I was to crop in all the way. And the HDR certainly does its job when it comes to slightly brightening up the image and providing a little more contrast and pop to darker backgrounds, which is appreciated. Overall, it's not a shabby shooter for, again, a budget price. Maybe the only weakness would be that wide angle lens just in the sense that it's not quite as high resolution so you're able to zoom in even less and you can notice a lot more pixelation compared to the primary shot however it still is a pretty complete setup now when it comes to connectivity and reception quality, thankfully the Salro 5G also does well here. I was getting almost full bars uh, with Boost Mobile's 5G network, which is using AT&T cell towers, along with the microphone and earpiece both sounding loud and clean with no real hints of distortion. Here's a demo of the Qi wireless charging working as advertised. While the video is loading there, you can see the keyboard is standard Gboard and support swipe, although one slight limitation of most budget phones, and this is no exception, would be the haptics. It works fine, but it definitely isn't quite as premium or tight feeling as on more flagship phones. It rattles just a little bit more, but overall still works. So loading back a video here, let's also test what these speakers sound like. All right, so takeaways would be the speaker quality is really not shabby, at least uh, peak volume sounds decent, doesn't distort too much, but it's not a stereo speaker. So perhaps if they had the ability to add one to the earpiece, it would be even better, but at least you also have a headphone jack and also the latest Bluetooth chip, which allows you to connect to other headphones and speakers as you would desire. It's pretty fast, again, when it comes to loading speeds, thanks to the good connectivity, coupled with the Snapdragon 695G is no slouch. It offers actually pretty good performance in day-to-day -day usage as you can see here without much hints of lag or delay when it comes to these basic tasks like watching videos and navigating around the UI. The screen again is very good when it comes to watching back content. It's quite immersive. Although I will say perhaps the peak brightness could just get a little bit brighter if you are in direct sunlight, but it's also not bad, still is easy enough to see in most scenarios and gets the job done. A large display, which is great for media consumption, 
So it's not surprising that similar regular usage apps such as browsing the web can also be handled pretty flawlessly thanks to that fast refresh rate and also pretty capable chipset in the mid-tier category that it doesn't pose an issue when it comes to swiping around, everything still feels quite smooth, even as we're doing a bit of multitasking as you can see here. The 695 is also a very cool chip, so it never really overheats or gets warm during usage either, which is good. No hints of thermal throttling here. 6GB of RAM is also quite sufficient on a entry-level phone, and it provides, in my testing, sufficient multitasking capabilities without things having to reload too often if you have, say, 8 or 10 different apps in the background, along with a handful of tabs in the browser, no issues there. Let's try jumping into a page such as The Verge and see how it handles. Uh, loading back a new web page, and you'll see that it is pretty fast, as you can see there. So in practice, although it's not going to beat the latest, say, 8 Gen 2 or Snapdragon's 800 series chipsets, it's honestly not as big of a difference as you would expect when it comes to just general usage like web browsing. It's really when you're talking about super demanding tasks like heavy gaming, AAA titles, that's when that difference is more significant. As well as doing a little bit of light gaming, it certainly doesn't pose an issue either. Even, I would say, mid-tier games, even PUBG, can be installed on here without too many issues, although you may have to slightly lower some of the graphic settings to have the smoothest experience. You will notice that because of the slightly taller aspect ratio for the screen, depending on the game that you're playing, if it's not completely optimized, there will be a little bit more of a black bar there on the side, but overall it doesn't get too much in the way of the device, although it is a pretty long phone when you're holding it. Playing back some Game Boy titles, uh, as well as even DS games, PSP games, if you're installing a emulator app, it can also perfectly handle on here without any real complaints. And I have to say that it is a pretty impressive showing. It's not a case of just the specs looking good on paper, but the actual experience is surprisingly well put together as you start using it. It's a phone that looks very premium, although a little bit derivative of an iPhone, but nonetheless it feels quite solid. The great display, along with actually pretty solid camera as well for the low price, good connectivity, and overall pretty reliable specs. So as a new Android smartphone, phone, it certainly is one of the better values that you can find. Charging speed could admittedly be a little bit faster, perhaps one area they could improve on in the future, but really aside from that, there's not too much that you can scoff at for this entry-level price. You can check out additional details if you're interested in the links down below, but for now that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Celero 5G Plus.